So with that, um, welcome here this morning to the breakout session on uh, this linkage between the CFO, the uh, CSOs, Chief Sustainability Officer, and IR professionals in terms of multi-capital collaboration. Uh, we are um, uh, developing conversations within business and society at large as to what's becoming known as balanced stakeholder capitalism. Uh, within this newest thinking are the six capitals, and just for reference, human, natural, intellectual, social, manufactured, and financial, and finding that balanced stake. Our panel today will discuss how the CFO and the C-suite engages in creating collaborations related to multi-capitals model and the practical side of what to do and how to do it. So I'd like to welcome Suzanne and John and Kathleen, and thank you very much for uh, being with us here today. Um, I'd like you to please introduce yourselves um, and who you work with, and then begin with just a couple of things. Tell us how your organization is looking at this problem from a reporting perspective. And give us uh, one practical example of what you're doing specifically in terms of the integrated reporting. And Susan, would you mind kicking us off? Thanks. Sure, happy to, and, and really happy to be here uh, for this discussion. Um, it, so yeah, so I'm Suzanne Fallander. I lead Intel's Global Corporate Responsibility Office at Intel, um, which uh, really works on strategy integration across the company, stakeholder engagement, including, and I'll talk more about this, uh, uh, outreach with our investors on ESG issues, and also reporting and disclosure, again, with an integrated approach with our IR and, and corporate governance teams. Um, you know, actually, it's been interesting for me, especially this morning's kickoff, because I started my career on the investor research side, worked uh, uh, on social investment research at, at institutional shareholder services for many years. So it's been really interesting to see you know, how things have continued to evolve, especially in the last you know, 18 months. Um, for Intel ourselves, we've been doing uh, reporting uh, and integrating uh, corporate responsibility and sustainability across our business for many years. We did our first voluntary environmental health and safety report back in uh, 1994, so pre-GRI. Um, but over the over time, have continued to evolve our disclosure. And I'd say that the key theme in how our disclosure has evolved has been around this concept of integration, embedding uh, different corporate responsibility and sustainability functions across the organization, and really a much tighter partnership with investor relations, um, our CFO, our executive leadership team, and also our corporate secretary's office, um, really looking at that connection uh, to the board of directors. Um, one practical example, and we can dig into this too, is um, we have uh, across our external reporting, you know, financial team, our uh, governance team that does the proxy statement, and my team that does the corporate responsibility report, we used to do them separately and keeping each other informed. Now we really do uh, put together the, these different disclosures using an integrated uh, approach. We're all you know, part of the same teams that, that look at these and make sure that we're driving um, a consistent look and feel, consistent uh, indicators, consistent messaging with different levels of detail based on the audience. Um, but we actually have been using for the last uh, couple of years the six capitals. So we've used that in our 10K, in the proxy statement, and across the corporate responsibility report. And we've gotten a lot of good feedback uh, from our investors um, as we do integrated outreach um, directly with our largest uh, shareholders and, and a broad range of different types of investors on these issues. So thanks. I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Suzanne. The, the, uh, when you and I first talked, I loved that idea of how you've integrated that process. And if we have a minute or two later, uh, maybe talk about uh, in the proxy statement how the company looks at assurance, but we'll we'll hold that for, for later. Kathleen, would you do us the honors, please? Sure. Well, Scott, thanks for having me here with you all today. I'm Kathleen McLaughlin. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at Walmart. And, you know, similar to Suzanne at Walmart, uh, we've been reporting for many years now. In our case, we first came out with our what we now call ESG report uh, back in 2007. And we've been reporting on a whole range of environmental, social, and governance uh, metrics and strategies since then. We have a ESG disclosure committee, and we take a holistic view across financial and non-financial disclosures, because for us, we're very much grounded in this notion of shared value. So the topics that we're taking on, uh, whether they're environmental issues or social issues or even governance issues, we're always doing it through the lens of what does it mean for value creation for the business in, in a traditional financial sense, 
but then what does it mean for creating value for stakeholders and making progress on whatever that issue is um, externally? And so our reporting tends to reflect both the sort of business impact and then the societal impact. And I can provide a bit more detail as we get into the discussion. Yeah, and given the the global scope of, of Walmart and your and your supply chain, integrating that, especially thinking about it from a societal point of view and people that maybe are indirectly engaged in the supply chain, that just the the, the magnitude of of that just is is over the top and stunning. Thank you, thank you for being here, Kathleen. John. Yeah, it's Scott. Thank you again for uh, having me here. Um, I'm John Hanselman. and I'm the CEO of Vanguard Renewables. Um, we are the largest food waste recycler in the U.S. Uh, we recycle food waste into uh, renewable natural gas and renewable electricity uh, and low carbon fertilizer. Uh, so a very interesting model. We, uh, as, a, as a practical example of uh, how we've been working with reporting. So back in 2016, we uh, joined a strategic alliance with the Dairy Farmers of America, uh, who had done a fantastic job actually kind of analyzing and benchmarking what they had uh, in terms of their emissions and their all of their their different ESG uh, concerns around dairy and renewables. And we were able to work with them. Uh, and uh, we kind of come on, on the practical side where we help them set um, an understanding of what they could be doing uh, with, with those different waste streams. Um, we then reached out and worked with um, several of an announcement next week uh, several large uh, food uh, producers and retailers to kind of set uh, the goals and objectives as to how um, they could attain those those different levels um, and then kind of worked internally. And, and obviously the challenge for us is um, it's multi-stakeholder. So you've got facilities, uh, the, the facilities management side, the procurement, um, and setting those benchmarks and milestones and being able to communicate them um, throughout the organization is, is really the most challenging part of what we do. Um, a lot of our stuff, again, kind of we deal with um, some of the externalities, but we, we try and make it as, as direct and measurable as possible. So being able to put that, that measurable data back in front of them as to current status and what you could see if you in, start to institute the, the recycling and the reusing of the renewable natural gas has, has been the big challenge for us. Um, real quick, before we jump into the first uh, question set here, John, uh, um, without getting too technical, how do you deal with the data integration problem? It, 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 it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And, and again, really what we did is, is kind of at the beginning, we, we learned the hard way, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, so going in, we try and identify all the stakeholders up front. So being able to say, you know, who's got the different data on, on different waste streams, on the um, energy utilization, um, energy product mm -hmm. uh, and then get all those folks at a kickoff kind of at the beginning. That's, that's really been our big learning, which is, is start by identifying everyone uh, and understanding what, where we're going to get before you start even doing the data collection. Um, there's a organization associated with the Institute of Management Accountants, the IMA, uh, that has a task force with, I think it's over 70 people now, uh, with just looking at data taxonomy just the identification of the data elements across industry. And it's, it's just a huge, it's a huge issue, especially when we get into interoperability and comparability and, and so forth. Well, so with that, thank you for, for those introductions. Let's sort of jump in. Um, and any one of you can sort of decide who wants to go first, because we didn't sort of pre-select that in advance, but how does one in organization go about bringing the issue, this issue, uh, uh, where ESG innovation and, and investment is, and then reporting uh, to the forefront in an organization in terms of A, its importance and why we should be doing it in the first place, and then B, how to go about it organizationally. How do you, how do you approach it? Or maybe said a little differently, what are the, some of the internal processes that you use and or recommend that can bring this you know, together? Yeah, I can start. I can jump in. I think the um, a couple things. One, maybe a good example is we just launched our new long-term 2030 
strategy and goals around corporate responsibility and sustainability. And, and for that, you know, we really did want to take much more of an integrated approach, which I think is really the, the way that you can help get this embedded and get the buy-in that you need from all the different functions and really tap into the expertise that exists in all these different functions across the company. So we went through this uh, really in-depth process of, of really looking at what was changing in the external environment, what was changing in the minds of our stakeholders. So thinking about how investors were looking at these issues differently, what our customers were doing. So if you think about our customers setting new long-term goals, also looking at um, what, how this was changing in the calculation for our employees and our future talent. Um, so that was a really a, at the forefront of those discussions as we went through the process of, you know, of you know, closing out on our 2020 goals and saying, what would it take to lead over the next decade? And so that stakeholder approach, um, you know, really kind of bringing that in and, and as a data-driven company, bringing it back to um, the data, how we were compared um, to where we needed to be. Um, in terms of where we'd want it to be to lead, but then also how does it connect to value? So wherever possible, making that business case um, and, and being able to quantify the link between you know, the investments we're making in sustainability um, with financial returns. So one good example is on, on climate. Um, so certainly um, we've done a lot to invest in renewable energy. Um, our new 2030 goals are have a goal to get to 100% for our global manufacturing operations. We're already at 71%, which for manufacturers is, is, is quite significant, but we're pushing to do more. Uh, but on the energy side, we've been able to quantify how much we've invested in energy projects over the last you know, several years, and then how that's translated into dollars saved in addition to the kilowatt hour. So we invested 200 million in projects uh, since 2012. Wow. Um, we've saved 500 million in costs wow. and 4.5 billion kilowatt hours of energy. So that that resonates, you know, when when you're talking with different groups across the company who are engineers and or financial uh, teams of, of that this is. Is not something that's separate that they're they're interlinked um, one other thing I'd say is um, you know, that, that helps internally is um, really helping different teams to know where they can play a role in your strategy or in the disclosure so it's really this whole process has helped us to not just think about finance as the CFO's office or investor relations, but thinking about other teams within the finance organization and tapping into their expertise to help the other teams across the company, you know, get the best data. So I think it's it's about external outside in mm -hmm. views and helping make that and that connection to value and then internally, you know, really kind of focusing in on how the teams can specifically help. And uh, very mm -hmm. much focused on science based metrics, uh, the collection of that data and then the, and then the output of that data. Uh, there's a question here from Paul. I'll, I'll address this in a second. John, give us your take on this for a minute, would you please? Yeah, absolutely. So I think where we've been most successful with this is picking a very um, specific entry point, a, a project with the champion uh, where we had a measurable starting point. So we, we could collect all the data and understand kind of where we were starting the process and then have a very quick kind of achievable goal where we can show um, a significant change. Um, and <clears throat> that's been really helpful for us and, and being able to, to have that measurable attainment uh, for something. And, and for us, I think, especially with food waste and um, converting to renewable natural gas, natural gas, um, there are such um, kind of immediate and, and quick measurable changes uh, on, on greenhouse gas and emissions. And then we kind of said, okay, let's deal with going to supply chain partners um, and dealing with scope three emissions and, and things like that, but, but keep it as a very focused initial program where you're kind of instantly um, got all the stakeholders to have, have buy-in and to have um, a win. Um, I think that was, that was a big piece for us. And then John, when you do that, do you then help these, these various companies with sort of how to feed it back into their system, uh, how they yeah. report against it? Absolutely. A, a big part of what we do is, is then kind of um, all the metrics on on uh, you know what it, what's the conversion, what is that recycling creating, um, what is the greenhouse gas reductions, um, uh, feed that back, uh, and then and then talk about future plans. You know what are the things you can do next and next and next, and where else can we mine? And it, and it is it is complicated in that you've again you've got manufacturing, you've got distribution, mm -hmm. and and all those folks have their own 
um, silo of information, their, their kind of silo of, uh, or their, their own preferred practice. So we're asking them um, to change sometimes um, not in a major way and other times in, in a significant fashion. And so you're, you've got to feed that stuff back to them. Otherwise um, you can get an initial adoption and then, and then it kind of peters out um, quickly if, if people don't see this as, as something that's helping them achieve their, their, their goals and metrics. Uh, you know, it's interesting, um, just picking up on that, John, we have a similar uh, effort underway with emissions, uh, scope one, two, and three, and, and I think it relates to reporting a bit in that, you know, Scott, the broader point I'd make is, um, you know, the reason we're having this panel is we're not in a fully integrated world yet today, right, when it comes to reporting. We want to get there. Yeah. Yeah. We're probably at different levels, you know, on different issues, and, and one of the ones that um, may be, uh, you know, out of the gate faster than others is climate uh, and emissions reporting. And so one of the ways we've tried to come at it is lay the groundwork so that when the day comes, when we can have fully integrated reporting, we're ready in terms of the quality, the metrics, the consistency, the assurance, everything else. So um, what we tried to do on, on emissions is set a science-based target under the science-based target regime for scope one and two and scope three. Uh, our scope one and two, we actually just recently kind of elevated that ambition um, to kind of go beyond even the one and a half degree trajectory, mm -hmm. zero emissions in our operations and our fleet by 2040. But then to your point, John, for scope three, you know, how do you go beyond your own and work with suppliers? And so as a retailer, just given the nature of our business, there's a lot of emissions in supply chains, food supply chains, apparel, everything else. So what we did is we lined out across all categories and suppliers uh, kind of a platform where people can come and set goals and then we can support them in different ways in six different arenas. So energy, waste, uh, plastics, product design, sustainable agriculture, uh, and deforestation. And then what we did from a reporting perspective is build into our platform the ability to report through CDP at the same time they're engaging in our efforts. So that way, you know, we're trying to encourage more, and more people to disclose through CDP and follow that protocol. And then we're also encouraging folks to align with TCFD. Mm -hmm. So you know, do your risk assessment for your own company, make it into your strategy, get your actions going, report it out in this way. So we, we really are trying to think through convergence and how do we drive to a solution that would be consistent across industries, across sectors and so on. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, to answer your question about you know, how, how do we kind of come at it more broadly at Walmart, we start with this idea of shared value that um, environmental, social, governance, financial issues and metrics are all integrated. And that for companies to maximize financial value creation, they need to be creating value, uh, addressing the needs of stakeholders. Because if you don't do that, you don't have a business. I mean, that's the whole reason you're in business in the first place, obviously for the customer, for your employees, you know, for suppliers, for communities, it all has to work together. So it's pretty integrated in terms of our assessment. We step back and we say, okay, what are the material issues in the environmental, social governance arenas for our business? And then for the most material or most relevant issues, whether or not they would fall under SEC reporting requirements mm -hmm. today from a strategic perspective, you know, the issues that are most relevant, we then create strategies to get some type of outcome that you know our stakeholders are asking for for society and that makes sense for our business. So in the case of emissions, it's about emissions reduction and we do it in a way that makes sense for our operations, our fleet, suppliers, as I just mentioned. And then those strategies typically involve actions we can take as Walmart using the assets we have, our products, uh, our services, our operating model, could be jobs, could be purchase orders, relationships, advocacy, so they're pretty robust strategies, as robust as our, you know, our customer strategies uh, to go after those things. And then they're embedded all throughout Walmart. So the real estate people are the ones that are driving the renewable energy, you know, power purchase agreements. And the merchants are the ones that are working on packaging. And, you know, the people teams and the operators are the ones working on upward mobility of entry level people, you know, training and so on. So whatever the issues are, they're very much embedded right in the business. So the relevant metrics get reported from an operations perspective, right on people's day-to-day -day management scorecards. And then some of those, depending on SEC requirements and so on, end up in our actual 10K 
-hmm. and the ones that don't that are still relevant for making progress on these issues and relevant for our business, those are in our ESG report. It's still, you know, I think as Suzanne, you were saying, they're two different reports, very much related and shaped together for slightly different audiences and different standards. And then we do see that converging more and more over time. Um, wow. I, uh, we had all talked before this session and put together some notes, and now I'm finding this could go so many different directions. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to go to what Paul asked a minute ago, and then I'll come back to a couple of points here. Uh, Paul asked uh, up in the chat, what sustainable slash ESG metrics will do any of you think will be reported on in the earnings calls quarterly? Um, uh, and in that insight, is, the, is it directly related to or adjacent uh, as it relates to, to, to uh, traditional Wall Street? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can hop in. It, we've been actually integrating uh, different ESG uh, topics into our earnings calls uh, over the last year. Um, in terms of having a, a standard, you know, set of core metrics, it's changed a, a bit um, each time. Um, but we we have made sure to integrate that in. Um, it also, when we launched our 2030 strategy and goals, you know, working with the IR team in terms of making sure it ladders back to that and the strategy and, and which is uh, in support of our purpose uh, to create world changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on earth. So if you have kind of your purpose, here's how the ESG strategy is integrated and helps advance that, then having that be part of the CEO's presentation at earnings uh, makes sense. Um, the other thing, we just recently um, redid our investor relations website you know, to make sure it was a bit more integrated there as well. Um, but I do think one of the things that we found in our outreach, so earnings calls is one piece of the of the communications outreach, but making sure it's integrated um, in all the outreach that you do. So one of the things that we've found very helpful is doing outreach with our executives and with our, our largest investors as a team. So people say, oh, well, investors never ask about these questions when we meet with them. Well, I think what we've found is by talking about it and showing how it's important to your business, it actually is generating um, more, you know, comments and questions, um, and and so I think it's 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 a little bit of a, a chicken and egg piece. If you don't talk about it, then maybe you're not going to get those questions. And and also the other piece is thinking about just as as Kathleen and I were talking about the integration that continues on that journey on the corporate side. We're seeing. Uh, that happen on the investor side as well. So if you think about, there's different functions within a, a large investment firm. You have your fundamental analysts, you have your governance teams, you have your environmental and social analysts. They haven't always been as integrated on their side. And what we're seeing is much more deliberate integration there. And sometimes we're now in calls with those teams together in the same meeting. That's driving, I think, more of that connection to value. So I think it's, it's, it's about really thinking holistically how does the earnings call fit into the rest of the communications? Yeah, we've um, seen that too, again. Suzanne. It's been really interesting, hasn't it? Like last five years, mm -hmm. there's been a, a big evolution, uh, you know, even in the investor community and, and who they bring to meetings and how the conversation goes much more integrated today. And yeah, it, it, same thing for us. You know, in the earnings calls, um, Doug and the leadership team tend to talk about whatever that quarter is, is most relevant uh, and it ends and flows. But typically right. what you'll hear us referring to would be the latest stats uh, related to the topics that are most relevant for our purpose as a company. And so you will hear about uh, climate. So as we hit different targets around emissions reduction, you'll hear about waste diversion and waste avoidance. You'll hear about on the human capital side, uh, what's been happening with the promotions of our frontline people internally. Uh, it's something we track very closely. Um, and just the, the broader proposition for our people in terms of training and education. So you'll hear about that, how many people have we been developing in jobs for advancement. Um, racial equity is something that we've moved now to disclosing twice a year, very much more granular data about the advancement, the hiring, the retention of women, of uh, people of color broken down by race and ethnicity. And, and that's something we want to do every six months because we think that'll help us go <coughs> faster, um, uh, you know, so those, those will tend to be some of the things we'll talk about. And, you know, some quarters, there's not a lot of news to report and others there is mm -hmm. certainly at year end. That's when we do our big uh, assessment of the, of the total year. And so we tend to talk more about it at the, um, at that time. I love the uh, transparency of that. That is just huge. And it's a testament to a good governance model. Um, 
John, any any other uh, thoughts on this first question? Yeah, and I, I think I can only speak secondhand to it. But what, what's interesting, at least from our standpoint, is you know we have over the last seven or eight years been working kind of with a lot of the the early movers in in the um, ESG movement. And what's remarkable now is that mm-hmm. even in some of the more traditional uh, oil and gas customers of ours, they, they are a hundred percent focused on being able to bring forward um, metrics and and data about what they're doing um, and what their plan is going to be over the next decade to, to meet all the all the goals of on climate. Um, before we cascade into some of the science based stuff, two two quick questions: Do the three of you have you seen a, a marked change uh, in interest levels in the last two or three years compared to years before? In other words, does it feel like it's crossing that knee of the curve? Uh, that, that's the first one. Let me let me just stop there. Are you seeing a change? And, and how, how, how? Yeah. I mean, do you think it's hit the knee of the curve? I, I think we're yeah. I think we're in the hockey stick part, um, at least from my perspective. Yeah, I think it's been steady for for many years, but I think the the level of conversation and different types of conversation I'm seeing both internally and then the types of conversations we're having with our investors. So on the investor side, we we do uh, our. In addition to the year-round outreach we do, we do kind of a focused outreach in the fall as we get ready to think about the next 10K, the proxy, the, the corporate responsibility report. And so we've been having uh, meetings last uh, week and, and, and into next week, um, including some of the meetings had at our chairman of the board in the meetings with us, um, because I think directors are now increasingly mm-hmm. having these direct discussions with investors. Um, but I think what I've seen is is the engagement increased with our CFO and our CFO's office. Um, our CFO sits on what was mentioned this morning, the Accounting for Sustainability uh, group, um, but also having the engagement from the Treasury's office, um, you know, other the, our inter- internal audit, um, external reporting, all these different groups, really starting to have that discussion of you know how do we take this to the next level. Um, so, and, and if you think also one of the big things about our, and this goes back to what Kathleen was saying, our strategy for 2030 is different than our, our goals for 2020 were. They're much more collaborative and aspirational um, in, in some of these areas. It's, we do have a, you know, clear quantitative goals on what we're going to do ourselves to reduce our footprint of, of Intel's operations and our supply chain. We've also set out these collaborative initiatives to work with others in the tech industry to advance work on diversity and inclusion more broadly throughout the technology sector to work on how do you get more companies to adopt, be able to adopt science-based targets, given that our industry had done a lot of early action uh, before, and how do we continue to really look at that product impact? We make you know one, one part of kind of the technology system, but we really can enable sustainability across you know all of our uh, technology customers, but also for a whole other sector. So really driving those different conversations, that means you're talking with sales and marketing more regularly. That means you're talking with different product teams and some of the deep, deep experts um, kind of in our in our R&D areas of, of how do we really rethink conceptually, how do we move the market? So that, I think, is what gets me excited and I think, you know, makes it that there's so much more opportunity ahead. Challenges and the complexity increase dramatically in, in that. So mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's getting easier, mm-hmm. but it is, I definitely think, creating more opportunity. Any other thoughts on that one? Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, picking up on um, what Suzanne just said, you know, so many of these issues that we're tackling in the environmental or social arena, certainly maybe a little less so in terms of governance, are about transforming systems. You know, these are not easy things, right? To decarbonize business to, you know, John, what you guys do, right? To to avoid waste and, and make something good out of what would have been waste otherwise, you know, waste to energy. Like, that's a big thing. Um, equity. My goodness, it's a systemic transformation, right? And so from a reporting perspective, um, one of the things I like about the six forms of capital as a framework, I think it's really interesting, is it does help you perhaps focus on some things that could be leading indicators or might take some time to show movement. And then of course, if you consider the broader system around something like climate or equity, there's so many other factors to consider and report on. And so I think even if we get to a world where we have truly integrated reporting in terms of outcomes, environmental, social, governance, financial, and a nice, you know, succinct 10K, we'll still want to have some other companion 
you know, materials and reports to get deeper into other elements of the system that are shifting and evidence that things are moving. And, and, and these things are so complex. Um, it, it's one of the things that makes it a little bit challenging to come up with the one metric for it. Okay, yeah. are we making progress on climate you know, emissions? Yeah, I guess, but all the things that sit behind it that have to shift to sustain that, you know, there's, there's 20 metrics that we need to consider. Yeah, it's one of the things. Go ahead. I, I'd follow on, I think, with, with what Kathleen's saying is remarkable. What we see is, is kind of at the staff level, you know, everyone has accepted, uh, or most folks have accepted climate-based targets. They've set some set of goals and criteria um, at the CFO, CSO level. What is interesting about the reporting is it's now forcing folks uh, internally to kind of look at their standard practices, as, as Kathleen was saying. You know, what are the things that we can we can change? And what you see, or what we're seeing kind of at the ground level is an understanding that these things actually now matter and that need to be in that reporting structure, they're in the KPIs, they're in the things that the people are doing to, to kind of on their daily work schedule. And that's that's a big change. Um, and that's, I think, where you, you kind of see that hockey stick kicking in, um, which is where, where really everybody on the team um, has an understanding that this is something they've got to do. I think, as both Kathleen and Suzanne said, not small. Um, these are hard things. The easy stuff is already done. Um, you know, now it's like, okay, what are the component pieces where we can really make dramatic change still? Um, and, and, and again, I think it's Kathleen, not only in-house, but with your supply chain partners and, and say, okay, how do we get that, those scope three emissions uh, to start trending the way that you want to see them go? We're going we're gonna to touch on science-based metrics here in, in a couple of seconds. Uh, one final question here. You know, on, in Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, there is a new standard of uh, attestation that's made by the CFO and the CEO uh, that has really, like, very big teeth in it. It's, it's very powerful. Do you, do, you, do you see that standard and the related assurance items g getting in the way of people – uh, disclosing this stuff it, because there's a concern, hey, maybe we can't get it to the same standard or, 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 and if so, would you have any recommendations or what are your recommendations about how you deal with it in your companies? Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I would say about um, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to lay in the infrastructure so that we could be ready for fully integrated reporting on environmental social governance metrics and so on. And it is true that a number of the metrics, um, you know, historically don't rise to the Sarbanes-Oxley level of mm -hmm. standardization across industry. You know, do people use the exact same definition for that metric company to company, industry to industry? the quality of the data gathering and the controls environment that sits behind those metrics can be highly variable. Mm -hmm. And so I do think we have a ways to go uh, to where we have every company being at the same definition and level of quality and so on. Um, so there's a lot of work going on in many places, many companies to try to move in that direction. So for example, for us on the question of assurance, um, we have started with things that are easier, you know, things that are quantitative metrics like emissions, right? Somebody can come in and look at that and validate it and measure it. And as I mentioned, we, we disclosed through CDP and we have, um, we've had Deloitte helping us with various pieces and Lucidian coming in to assure the numbers of our oh, nice. scope review and that sort of thing. Um, you know, there are a lot of other arenas where we work where we're still even trying to figure out what the metrics are, you know? So for yeah, example, yeah, um, right. <laughs> you know, if I do something like forced labor in the seafood chain, Okay, yeah. that's an issue way back in the chain right. in Southeast Asia. It's pervasive. It's certainly not like a Walmart issue. So this is a whole industry. And what would you measure? You know, we, we funded studies to look at prevalence and incidence of slavery way back in the, it's the part of the chain where they, they literally catch the food that they then feed to the, the seafood, um, the shrimp. So we've done like the one-off study to do like prevalence and incidence for the field, but would you do that every year? And how would you know if that, like, and, and that's, that's clearly not, you know, something that's going to show up in the 10K soon, but you, I just yeah. used it as an example to show probably the hardest thing to measure, which would be human rights in seafood. How would you ever know? And you've got everything between. So from that to emissions, yeah. all kinds of levels of complexity, right? Yeah. But that's the direction of travel. So we, you know, what we're trying to do is um, put in place the processes so that when people 
um, have a number that they want to disclose. There's a claims process, a validation process. It's get, it gets vetted at least internally. We want to start vetting it externally. Like that's the direction of travel for sure. And I think we'll see more and more things going that way to where you know, we could say, yep, ready to put that in the 10K, you know, if, if when that day comes. We've uh, we've touched on this a little bit, but uh, Phil Clausen in, in the audience uh, asks a question uh, related around racial equity and specifically blacks in the U.S. and maybe broader social justice and inclusion. Question is, has your engagement with your CDO and with your finance and IAR changed and or accelerated in this past year? And are you uh, in what way are you making or are you making bigger commitments in terms of targets and goals? And are you getting ready to share those commitments? Yeah, so I can start. Um, it, one of the things that um, we actually had released our 2030 goals um, two weeks before uh, George Floyd was killed, and we already had set out pretty big ambitious goals to not only double uh, the number of women in our senior leadership uh, ranks, but also um, for our underrepresented minorities um, in, in senior leadership. So we had had that out, but right after uh, that occurred, um, Certainly, our CEO was very vocal um, in those those early days. A lot of uh, deep engagement um, internally across our employee base, especially in the United States, but globally. Um, and we have uh, done some additional um, acceleration of the work that was already you know planned and underway. Um, but by really kind of engaging with our employees directly, um, you know, one of the things that has been important for us is being really open and transparent on where we are and where that we're not satisfied. Um, where we have been and understand the complexity of what it's going to take to continue to drive you know, true inclusion, um, not only at Intel, but across the industry. So um, in terms of my engagement directly with our, I've always had a very strong relationship with our chief diversity and inclusion officer, as well as our chief people officer. And actually the last two months we've, we've uh, reorganized a bit and now I'm actually um, working directly for uh, oh, wow. her in, in that organization so that we can elevate all of this work together. Because we do think that human capital um, management, um, engaging employees around all of our 2030 goals, not just in the social space, but in the environmental space is really going to take that, driving that accountability throughout the whole company at all levels. So I think that's, you know, no matter where CSOs or CROs sit in an organization, I think um, we always try to figure out where does it need to sit at certain times so that we can mm -hmm. go faster. And one thing I'll just say also on the assurance piece, because um, a lot of what Kathleen said, I think reflected our, our journey as well. We, we started actually doing third party assurance uh, back in 2012. And over the years have really, we did start more on the environmental side and, and we really have been um, you know, moving into the more uh, social uh, metrics, uh, starting with health and safety, but then actually doing um, assurance over some of our diversity metrics as well. Um, and we are happy we've done that because I think it's continued to strengthen our internal systems just as um, there's more and more focus on the investor side around, mm -hmm. you know, the S of ESG. So I, I do encourage, mm -hmm. it's it's certainly a learning process. It's, it's you know, you're not, not one and done. You, you talked about human rights and seafood. Certainly we learned a lot through the conflict minerals uh, process of something, you know, it's way down in our supply chain and, and really understanding how do you um, engage um, and do assurance over all of that work as well that then helps across the rest of the more process and, and long-term. But I just add issues. on the racial equity question is, um, you know, similar to what Suzanne said, we've had goals and programs efforts underway for quite some time, but there's no question this year represents an acceleration, I think, for, for so many in society, which is good. It's needed because obviously the outcomes, when you look at disparities faced by Black people and African Americans in any system you want to pick, health, education, financial, criminal justice, massive gaps, so, um, so yeah, we, we have absolutely redoubled our efforts and we're looking at it in a couple ways. So one is our own uh, associate base and advancement. We have 6.8% this year and it hovers in at around 7% the last couple of years. Representation of black and African-American people in our officer ranks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more like 20% at entry level. Mm -hmm. So like anything else, you look at women, you look at indigenous mm -hmm. people, Hispanics, black people, you know, you tend to get that pipeline attenuating the more senior you go. 6.8 is not bad compared to like the average company, but it's certainly not where we want to be. If you consider 13% of people in America are black or African-American, we got a ways to go. 
So we're focused on that first and foremost. And as I mentioned earlier, we're now publishing twice a year our stats on that pipeline at a much more granular level than we ever have before. If you want to check it out, just Google it and you'll find the most recent one online. Or first one, I should say, at that level of detail. We'll do that every six months now. So we've redoubled that. And then what we've also done is said, okay, well, wait a minute. What about our customers? What about our suppliers? What about communities? We have so many assets as Walmart that we could be using you know, more creatively to be at the table addressing systemic racism, you know, more head on. We've always been addressing it as part of other things, you know, like the supplier diversity program, and we source 14 billion a year from diverse suppliers, things like that. But we never said, okay, let's take head on this issue of racial equity as it pertains to the black and African community in America as a thing. And what would that look like? So we've stood up four different teams. Um, one is on criminal justice reform, One's on financial disparities, health disparities, and then education as it pertains to workforce. And what we're trying to do is say, okay, well, where do we have an asset? We got a product, we got a service, we have um, jobs, we have purchase orders, we have our voice advocacy. What are the things that we could bring to bear in a different way that might, you know, help address the issue in partnership, obviously, with many, many other people. We're, we're like this much of the, of the solution, but we can be acting differently or better. So that's what we're trying to do. We're just in the middle of it now. Those teams have been in, in listening mode the last few months. Um, and we just launched a center for racial equity at the Walmart Foundation, which I also lead. And that is earmarking philanthropic capital to put against what we do in our company. So these things could go together. Um, you know, the philanthropy, we've committed 100 million over five years which on the one hand sounds like a lot of money. On the other hand, that is a drop in the bucket. Like the real action needs to be, you know, through our business assets and then the philanthropy can come in a targeted way and, you know, kind of extend and expand that. So that's, that's how we're approaching it. And we'll be reporting progress, um, you know, as we, as we go. I think we might have lost Scott, so we could. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so if you wanted to jump in on that at all, and then we can. equity, and diversity, and inclusion have always been at the forefront of what we do. Um, but uh, there's no question that uh, over the past year, you have to re-examine um, all of your your base and understand uh, your goals and and those that are achievable and those are aspirational and 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 really move towards those. So uh, it, it has certainly increased for us. So I have a question. I'm just going to go right down the list here. <laughs> well played. Okay. Targets. You know, was he coming back in? Anyway, how do you how do you ensure a science based approach to goal setting and external reporting? So how do you guys get close to the science? You know, in, in the work that you're doing when, you, when you're setting your goals, does that does that play a role? Yeah, sure. I mean, for us, um, it is, it's a hundred percent of what we do almost. Um, so we're, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah, for us, it, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and, and then the wonderful thing about dealing with, um, renewable natural gas and, and food waste and, and greenhouse gas emissions, which we're trying to uh, impede, uh, you have to set that, that, that base data. And, and so going in first and benchmarking, uh, I'm sorry, not benchmarking, so setting your, your understanding of, of where you're starting from with, with any and all of our, our customers is kind of first. Uh, and then what has been surprising to us is, is kind of the secondary and, and tertiary things that we can measure. So, you know, what else, what's happening on the farms? Um, are we, we're, we, we've been able to bring this low carbon fertilizer to the farm. So being able to say, okay, what's happening with their, reduction on synthetic fertilizers and how do we then quantify that and, and I think there's what's what's wonderful about science-based goals is it kind of forces you to go back and say okay what are all the different levels of impact and can you measure those and can you report those um, and it, it's been great fun for us to <clears throat> kind of unleash a whole bunch of very very smart um, we, we, much smarter than me uh, who can go out there and and look at each one of those subcomponents and saying how do we quantify those and are, are they important and meaningful? And if they are, how do you then report them up and out? 
Yeah, and and we've done some similar approach of really looking at kind of that that system level when we're looking at our goals. We've been setting climate related goals for a long time, and and also working together with others in the semiconductor industry to really drive that change. That you know, if each company did it on their own, you probably can't get uh, to those those higher level of commitments and reductions. We actually had led um, uh, work uh, back in the 1990s around PFC reductions are uh, part of the, the emission, direct emissions. Um, and then over time, we've continued to invest, um, you know, in driving um, different investments and different technologies and, and really digging into the data and working with outside groups and understanding, you know, where are some of these opportunities. We've actually been able to drive a 31% decrease in absolute emissions over the last two decades, even as we've considerably grown our global manufacturing operations. One of the things we're looking at now with our, our 2030 goals is we've set out to achieve carbon neutral computing, um, a big uh, global challenge where we know we have to work with all the other tech companies, but also kind of a much broader ecosystem uh, to, to drive that and really are gonna work directly um, through a technology industry initiative as part of the goals around uh, helping other companies to set science-based targets. One, one challenge in the current methodology is it doesn't always take into account all the reductions that have already taken place doesn't mean that you don't want to help everyone redouble their ability to get an, an approved science-based target. So we've continued to, even as we're working with others in the industry to move that discussion forward, continue to set targets to reduce absolute emissions as we're, as we're growing. So I think a lot of good learning. We're in a data-driven engineering company and, and a lot of external partnerships with academics. So thinking about you know how do we you know keep moving that forward. So another question for you guys um, that I'd love to know uh, more about is where where do you think investors go from here? So I agree with you, Suzanne, that we're kind of on the upswing of what feels like a hockey stick of interest and relevance. Um, what have you been hearing is helpful or needed from investors as they seek to make decisions about where to put their money? Yeah, I think the questions, to, most of the questions to date have been really just trying to get data to understand what, how to even begin to really integrate that into the process. So I think it's been really focused on transparency and disclosure. It's been focused on govern, govern, like governance and oversight processes to really understand, are these truly being integrated? You know, is the board involved? You know, is senior management involved or is it, you know, just talking points? Um, I think where we're moving now, especially as you have more of the fundamental analysts coming to the conversation, you have more, um, uh, uh, people really trying to dig in to understand what is the connection of this work to value. I think that's this next phase, right? So I think it's 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 now really digging into the performance connection. It's digging into does it reduce a company's risk? Are, is a company managing it better than their peers? And you know, does it are they actually investing that creates more market opportunity? You know, and and there was a really good uh, research. A report by George Seraphim recently that was really looking at, you know, right now a lot of the disclosure we've talked about is getting everyone to kind of a, the same, right, and, and, and basic information. Everyone's put in place similar programs. Really, how do you change this into more of like strategic advantage? So really thinking about it through the strategy lens and how does this help you advance the business, not just, you know, just doing what you have to do, but how do you really turn it into that strategic advantage? Yeah, I, I, I agree so, so much. And, you know, um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, historically, people who were in the investment community had some sort of investment thesis, right? They might look at a company like Vanguard Renewables or Intel and go, okay, so here's my thesis. Here's the company. Here's the value they create. This is how I think they're creating the value. They go interview the management team, right? They look at everything that you report and, and, your, and your progress. And they will come up with some sort of view that says, hey, I'm going to put my money in Intel or Vanguard Renewables because I think I'm going to create value in this way, right? And that was the story. I think we need the same level of rigor around ESG. So for someone to go, hey, here's what I think Intel is doing around this issue of you know, climate or Vanguard Renewables for waste, they're going to transform in these ways, right? And have a view that relates to the environmental or social or governance factors that are most of interest to them or their clients. And to do that, yeah, you need the data and you also need to do the problem solving or, 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 or the modeling, right, to have the view on the things. And it's right. not as simple as just, you know, tell me what your emissions is, ooh, that's good or bad. Like it has to factor into, right. you know, a, a view. Um, you know, it reminds me early on, this is like five years ago, we got a report card from an ESG 
ratings firm or a survey, I should say, and they said, well, tell us how much fuel did you use last year? Well, we own our own long haul fleet in Canada and the US. So the answer is a lot. We don't outsource to a third party. We use a lot of fuel. And they literally sent back our report card and gave us a sad face. And then we had the like the competitors had happy faces because they outsourced all the logistics. <laughs> Well, that's the business model is critical, right? So that's why I think the more people can can look at that context. We have the same thing with, you know, we sometimes we get compared against fabulous semiconductor companies. Of course, our water is going to look right. higher or direct emissions. So it's right. exactly and you, that example you, you said. So I think the sophistication. Right. And what do you do about yeah. it? What's your strategy? Right. And, and, and one of the reasons we have our own fleet is we think we can run it better. We think we can be more efficient. We think we can accelerate to a carbon zero you know, fleet, and that's where we're, you know, all those things. So it's just funny if you look at this. Right, but you're getting hammered in the meantime, right? That's great. Yeah, exactly. No, and I think that it's, yeah. it was, I guess I might, yeah. While, while we're finishing this question, John, maybe just throw it out for anyone who wants to yeah. put additional questions in in the chat, as I think we have a few. No, and I, I think that was so what was so on. interesting about uh, Bob Willard's presentations before. Um, uh, in, in, if As more and more of those tools can be standardized, um, where you can have that, comparative reporting so that you're not getting crushed because you happen to actually have a better fleet and, and are using better engines and, and better fuel store types, um, but you're actually still consuming at that level. Um, uh, it, it is, it's fundamentally important as we're all grabbing um, science-based goals to make sure that, that you have a way to actually um, create the metrics around that and understand the metrics and have them as comparable. Because I think that the ESG teams are growing significantly. We see this all the time um, within uh, all of the different um, you know, uh, groups, but they have to have a standardized kind of review platform so that, that, that you're not getting hammered as you're, you're actually doing some, some virtuous work and, and getting penalized for it. Uh, not great. You don't want to incentivize bad decision making. Where do you see things going in terms of um, providing that data? So one of the things I've noticed is a proliferation of organizations that each have a different set of data requirements and questions, lots of surveys that we get kind of over the transom. And I would say two, three years ago, we used to answer each and every one of those, right? We get somebody would come and say, oh, I got the survey. Can you give me this information? And what we found is we couldn't keep up. And we're now in this in-between period where I don't think we're disclosing enough at the level of detail that would satisfy all these people, yet we can't answer each of them. So we're, we're trying to go more in the direction of just disclosing as much as we can, make it easy to find by topic. And that way, you know, if anybody has a survey, we can say, oh, we'll go look here, here, and here for the answers, right? But we're, we're not quite there yet, but that's, that's where we think it's going. How about you guys? Are you feeling that? And how are you addressing that? Yeah, I think we've um, and and we get asked a lot, both both by our suppliers, but other other companies about how do you even get started in this? It's overwhelming, you know, with all these different um, ratings. And even a, a company that we've proactively engaged with the ratings for many years and continue to do so, we do need to prioritize. And so one thing we two things we do: one, we do try to optimize our public disclosure so that we're answering the majority of the questions across the multiple frameworks. So we're not going to chase every rating that's out there. We're not going to use every part of every framework necessarily, but we are going to make sure that our, our disclosure is going out to you know the, the public and to, to all of our uh, stakeholders covers um, the things that we think are a most important to our stakeholders, but also matter for our business. So there might be things we decide not to disclose because we actually don't think that's the right measure or you know there's kind of limitations on the context around putting the data out there. Um, the other thing we do do, especially on the investor side, is every time we do our outreach meetings, we ask you know which frameworks they're prioritizing. Uh, we ask um, which ratings that they're using the most, and then we spend more of our time making sure that data is as accurate as possible. So um, within the sea of, of acronyms and, and, and frameworks, making sure that we know which ones, and we can explain that internally to our finance teams and to our executives, here's why these are the ones that we think are worth spending more time on. Because obviously, you both live this, you know, there's, there's a trade-off in doing the work 
and, and reporting on the work. And so you have to get that balance right to make sure you have enough time to continue to drive those important strategic discussions internally without just spending too much time trying to recorrect information or, or yeah, fill I, it out. I think it has way. to be standards. I mean, I think this is in, in forums like this, I think have to push and call for standardization um, within the, the ESG uh, analyst community. Otherwise, it, it really is open to all sorts of question and doubt and uh, manipulation, and, and that doesn't work. And so to have it be effective and efficient and something where, where, you, where you can actually compare apples to apples, uh, standards have to start to be kind of, and, and, and super granular. I mean, uh, granular, sorry. Uh, you know, you've got to really be able to go down to the, what is emissions, right? What is what is uh, equity and diversity? I mean, it's, those things have to be specified. Uh, and I think that, that it's a huge challenge, but, you know, we've done standards before uh, many, many times. Uh, I think it has to be applied here as well. Looks like we had one question come in yeah, really from the group. Questions. So um, uh, it's what what are the biggest challenges you've seen or faced in partnering with finance and IR and any lessons learned? Yeah, I think my biggest challenge over time has just been um, kind of the questions in, you know, IR's head of, of, well, how do we make sure that we really know the quantification or does this connect to value and finding the research studies and finding kind of the, um, the, the data and detail that's, that's, that helps them make the case to others, I guess. Um, I think one of the, the key learnings and benefits has really been building a, a true partnership. Um, with investor relations. I, I, I joke with some of my counterparts at other companies that say, how did you get IR to talk to you? <laughs> um, but I'd say, it's, sometimes I joke, it takes a special kind of uh, investor relations leader to, to be open and to really think about and listen about how these things could be connected and kind of work together with the other teams across the company and executives to do that. Um, but I think it certainly helped a lot of other companies as investor relations is getting directly asked in their meetings um, to kind of look inward and, and really drive that internal discussion. Because I think it makes every team better. I think it certainly made me more disciplined in how we're thinking about the metrics and thinking about how do we, you know, what we pull together for the, the, the business case. Um, so I, I encourage everyone who's, if you're on, on the corporate side, um, start that conversation and, and don't leave out your corporate governance teams. Because I think that connection to the board and the corporate secretary role is really critical, just as, as important as with uh, your CFO and, and IR teams. I'll let you take it. I think we've got two minutes. One minute, it's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah. um, somebody once um, talked to me about this notion of the value of the seat. You know, what's the value of the seat for a chief sustainability officer, whoever, you know, whatever the title is, who holds that kind of role at a company? And I think that's really where it starts, is actually going more with the CEO and the total leadership team and have, if you don't feel that this world is integral and you aren't already joined at the hip of IR and finance, that's the place to start and say, what is the value of the seat? Because if the company doesn't appreciate that these things are totally intertwined, it's going to be really hard to get the attention of the IR or finance or whatever. It really has to be something that CEO leadership team right throughout is, is a thing. And so I'd say if you're if you're in that position where the com your company isn't quite there, work on that as your own little work stream in parallel with everything else you got going on. Because the day you get that, you will be joined at the hip with the finance person and the IR person. And, and, and that's really where we all need to get to. Hey everybody, I'm back. <laughs> Welcome back. Yeah, I, tried. Yeah. I, I tried to mobile hotspot in, but the band wasn't enough, and it Comcast took about six minutes to get back live. Or so, uh, but I was texting people, and they were saying you guys are doing great. So. We were just reading from the, you know, your great oh, notes good, and, good, uh, good, and good. comments in the chat. So. Well, well, listen, um, uh, I think we're at the hour. So I think we're going to have have to have to part. Um, so I, I'm glad I made it back just to say thank you. Uh, that is super great, and I can see from the from the chats that everybody kind of just took over. I love that. That's collaboration. And any real quick, any quick summary thoughts from any of the three of you? Just in in closing.
No, I just I think that there's just a lot of opportunity here. I think tra it's just transparency, integration, and and connection of value. And so, how do you dr keep driving those conversations, like Kathy said, at um, all levels of the company and engaging, especially your CEO and your CFO and leadership team, on 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 moving Thank that you. conversation forward. Well said. Perfect. Well, with that, um, I bid everyone adieu. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Thank you, Scott. Bye, everyone. Take care.